Hello and good evening, everyone. I am Anurag Kundu. I currently work as chairperson, Delhi Commission for Protection of Child Rights. I will be a host for the evening. Welcome, everyone. During the panel discussion, we strongly encourage you to participate and post all your questions to our panelists. You may do so in the chat box below or comments on our YouTube channel. You can also post your questions on social media for us. I'm sure. I'm sure. Our panelists would love to engage with your questions, share the reflections, and even learn from your questions. Let me now begin by introducing our panelists. Our first panelist is Dr. Land Pritchard. He is a Rice Research Director at Blavatnik School of Government at Oxford University. Widely published, he devised a four-part spell test to determine what is important for development. I, I will leave you to find out more about it later. Also joining us is Mr. Amit Kaushik. Amit is a CEO of Australian Council for Education Research, India. Formerly a civil servant, Amit played a key role in the formulation of the Right to Education Act. We also have the honor of Dr. Yap Banha joining from Singapore. Dr. Ha is the Director of Curriculum and Teacher Development at Pathlight School and Academic Director at Anglo-Singapore International School. For those interested, they must definitely read up more about the Pathlight School and how it caters to children with special needs. Our fourth panelist is Pranav Kothari. Pranav is a domain architect and vice president of large scale education programs at Education Initiatives. He was a member of the MindSpark product, a technology based, personalized, and adaptive tool for learning. We also have amongst us Dr. Jeremy Hodgan. Jeremy is a professor of mathematics education at the Institute of Education, UCL is based in the Department of Curriculum Pedagogy and Assessment. Honestly, I've never seen so much mathematics per centimeter square in any tweet as much as I see in his ones. So do follow him for very interesting insights, particularly on mathematics. But before we begin, let's hear from Lucy Crehan, who has been a key force behind the design of this conference. Lucy is an international consultant and has published a book called Clever Lens. Lucy, we'll begin with you. You said in your book uh, that the most impo important principle that you learned as part of your research conversations and in-depth understanding uh, was that to support children to take on challenges rather than making concession was the most important principle. Your book has repeatedly emphasized this in many ways across chapters. What did you mean by this? Help us understand what does, which is a topic of our panel discussion also, supporting children to take on challenges rather than making concession even mean? Lucy. Thank you, Anurag. Um, this is, I'm very excited about this panel because I think this is, gets to the core of, of what it means to be an effective and equitable education system. And I'm really looking forward to learning from all of our, the expert panelists today. So, so the first thing to say is if this is it's a principle, of course, it's not a policy um, there, there aren't individual policies, I don't think, or certainly not many that will work across many different contexts, um, which is why I, I've gone for underlying principles as opposed to specific policies. Um, and these are principles that that I believe, based on my research, underlie high performing and equitable systems, crucially, because there are some differences between high performing and less equitable and high performing with with that equity. So I suppose the first, the first thing to start by saying is just acknowledging the fact that there's a natural variation in skill and knowledge that children bring to school with them. Um, part of that as a result of, of their home environment, um, which to some degree can be mitigated by high quality early years provision, for example. Um, and to some degree, it, it is genetic. If we look at the research um, on intelligence, um, it's, it's widely misunderstood. It doesn't mean that children can't learn. Every child can learn. But there will be differences in terms of how easy or how difficult children find it to pick up concepts. And that's, that's really kind of what, what we're dealing with here is how, how do we manage that variation um, in terms of what children come to school with in terms of their aptitudes. Um, and different education systems take different approaches to that variation. Um, and, and those different approaches have different effects. So some education systems, effect, well, they won't say this, but they effectively will operate as a sorting system, whereby they are, they are selecting children, they're trying to identify where is the talent in the system, um, take those children, continue to educate them, and the others either drop out of school um, or are put in schools that are um, for lower achieving children. Um, and, and whether that's done well or not, 
um, makes obviously a big difference to those children's outcomes because many systems it'll be the case that children in those um, the less academic schools have very few life chances they've dropped out um, of the the mainstream academic system on the other hand um, Singapore is is one of the highest top um, performing systems in the world and Singapore does take this um, this sorting approach at a fairly young age at, um, at age 12 children go into different schools but the the difference in Singapore is that the children who are in the I suppose they're not called lower ability schools but schools that children who fail the tests for example go to they are still given a lot of input there's real thought put into how can we help these children um, to live productive and successful lives and become employable um, and actually it'd be great to hear um, from Banhar on this because North Flight School is one of those schools that, that gives those life chances to children who haven't done so well um, in their primary school leaving exam. Um, with the exception of Singapore all of the, the PISA top performing education systems, and this is for, for a few different PISA rounds back, um, certainly all of those in the top 10, with the exception of Singapore, they delay the sorting of children into different schools until later than the OECD average. So typically around age 15 or age 16, which means that they are intending to get all children to access the same curriculum right up until the end of compulsory education. And at that point, they will select into more academic high schools, for example. Um, and I think this is fundamental to, to both why they're high performing and why they're equitable is that they are the systems are designed to try and support all children to reach those curriculum expectations. Um, and if you look, well, no doubt discuss this in our panel, but if you look at the research on, on tracking internationally, there is a clear association between early tracking and inequity. So the, um, the child's background will have a larger impact on their ultimate outcomes um, if they are tracked into different schools um, or different classes earlier on. So what these systems are doing then instead is they are they're having all of their all of their students with with some exceptions, of course, children who are severely um, um, don't know if we the actually correct um, appropriate term in, to, to use but children who, who, who are clearly not going to be able to access the curriculum um, for their psychological difficulties they won't be included in the, the same class but most children are in a mixed ability group um, in the same school um, all trying to access the same curriculum um, and what I think would be wonderful to discuss in this panel is, is how you make that work um, both in terms of school structures um, and crucially pedagogy and possibly technology. It wasn't um, it wasn't a key tool used by the countries that I went to in terms of supporting students, um, but that may well be an option um, for other countries in terms of supporting students. So I've, I've talked quite a lot there, but essentially what I mean by this principle is is rather than saying, oh well, you're not so clever, we're going to put you in a, a different class and give you easier work and that will be your permanent track. Instead they're saying, no, we're aiming to have all students reach at least this level um, and we're going to support those who struggle to reach that level. Um, and the question, of course, for this panel is how? How do you support children to reach that level? And perhaps some of you might disagree with me, that's what we should even be doing. No, very interesting, Lucy. You said how we support our children to reach minimum level, and then we provide support to the students uh, according to their needs. But we do ensure in the process that there is minimum learning for, for every child in the process. You know. You mentioned repeatedly uh, about there is variation uh, in, in learning gains and how different systems across the world then use different techniques of sorting at different ages or not at all at, uh, as well. Now, at the underlying uh, uh, you know, premise on that is a certain curriculum. And Land, I, I'll come to you here. You have published a very interesting research paper on this subject. For those interested, it is titled The Negative Consequences of Overambitious Curricula in Developing Countries. Now, before proceeding, can you start us off by sharing with us some of the insights from your own research and that of others about how curriculum or curricular expectations can affect, affect learning gains over, over a period of time? Land? Um, I'd like to share a PowerPoint that I think because I... Uh, <laughs> Part of my, as an economist, maybe my natural language has shifted to uh, PowerPoint and I, I'm a visual person, so I like to share some graphs. So I'm gonna share my screen with some. Uh, 
And building off what Lucy just said, I think um, every education system does or should have the goal of equipping children adequately for the adult roles they will face. And that means getting them to universally some minimum level of competencies, capabilities, skills, and what links the time in school and the goals that we have for education systems is what we call the learning profile. How much does a child progress from year to year to year uh, in acquiring the skills, competencies, capabilities they need? And there's always been two risks with education systems. One risk is that children just don't stay in school or get in school and stay in school long enough, um, such that even if they were learning a lot per year, um, they would be able to reach uh, adequate mastery. But the other risk is that the learning profile is just too flat, um, meaning they just don't learn enough from year to year to even if they were to stay in school for extended periods, reach uh, the competencies they need. Now, I think the risk of uh, overambitious curriculum is that often the curriculum races ahead at far faster pace um, than what the children are actually progressing given the, their, the, the mix of their initial abilities and the instructional competencies they get. And as that curriculum races ahead, since teaching tends to be centered on a given level, and if you're too far behind, you just it's hard for you to keep up and stay up. And as the curriculum races ahead, children get left behind. And as Lucy pointed out, this turns education systems, not into education systems with a goal of universal mastery, but into selection systems or sorting systems in which children are just left behind. And when they're left behind, the learning profile flattens out. So this is an example of what I mean by a flat learning profile. This comes from a study done as part of the RISE study in Indonesia that assessed um, the knowledge competencies of uh, youth over very kind of fundamental arithmetic uh, and shows that basically their arithmetic capabilities didn't get any better from grade six to 12. Learning just completely flattened out. Those who were going to master it got some mastery in grades one to six and then it, it flattened out. And the reason we believe it flattened out is they really didn't acquire adequate conceptual mastery of the foundations in the early grades so that their, their ultimate progress was limited. Um, so it's really shocking that six additional years of schooling um, left children at very low levels of even mastery of simple um, arithmetic. So my argument is the, the problems can't be solved um, at the level that they were created. And the current education systems um, have not been coherent around learning goals. They haven't been built such that there was a clear overriding, understood, shared purpose of the system to which the system was then operated. And I think the goal around that I think an Indian system should um, cohere around is universal, early, conceptual and procedural mastery of foundational skills. And I think this is something Again, that a goal for universal means there is some threshold that every child can be expected to and can reach. It's, we need to focus on early um, because if you don't focus on early, by the time you think of remediating, it, it can be super hard to reconstruct the foundations. We need to focus on conceptual and procedural mastery and a real focus on foundational skills. And this is, in fact, the exact opposite of the way many systems are currently operating. Many systems, they, they're seen as selection systems in which the capable students, those who are able to learn, are selected. They don't focus on early. They focus on late. They have high-stakes sorting systems that are late, by which it's really too late for most children to, to, um, to learn. They don't focus on conceptual and procedural mastery. Um, too much is taught um, with too little attention to what was learned and what was actually mastered and incorporated and really part of the set. And 
the curriculum covers too much. It doesn't focus enough on foundational and tries to cover too much, um, too fast, um, with too little support. So I, I want to make this important distinction. By the way, I somewhat apologize. Nearly everything I'm saying I have learned from Indian researchers. So this is a little cold to Newcastle. Um, education initiatives, I think, has been pioneering in developing ways of measuring conceptual versus uh, rote mastery. Um, and, you know, what you see is when the child misses the foundation, more and more schooling barely helps. So this is just foundational, like what does learn, what does length really mean and how do you measure it? The rote way of teaching it just says, well, length is where the object ends on the a ruler. Um, but if you displace the object, children don't recognize that the length is only five. And if you look, you know, <laughs> Um, you know, 46% of children get this wrong in grade four, but even by grade eight, 38% still get it wrong. They just never conceptually mastered the concept of length and how to measure it, and hence can never apply it to novel situations. Um, and the evidence from the Asser's Beyond Basics is just really shocking how little kind of practical skills are being incorporated. Um, and so even answering a simple question like, how long did this girl sleep if she went to bed at 9.30 and woke at 6.30 a.m.? Uh, you know, even of the youth enrolled as undergraduates, only about half of them could answer this simple question that just requires kind of a mastery of what is, you know, how do you measure length of time? Um, and so it, it reveals how much of the curriculum races ahead. I'm going to skip some stuff here. Now, I want to emphasize just finally early because even though we often focus on grade 10 exam performance results or on PISA results, which are at age 15, um, if you don't master the foundational skills early, what we find from all the learning profiles we see is that huge inequalities across children by socioeconomic status and others emerge by grade three. Um, by grade three, some children are just hopelessly behind in the way the curriculum is racing ahead. And that needn't be true. Um, the, the profile can in fact um, be such that every child has a very steep learning curve in these early years, masters these foundational skills. But what it requires is uh, a focus on teaching and a focus on teaching at the right level, that is, you really need to reach out to each child from where they are and help them get to where they need to be. Um, and so conceptual and procedural mastery is in no way, shape or form, a foundational skills is in no way, shape or form dumbing down a curriculum. It is in fact a very challenging thing, a more challenging thing to, to have conceptual mastery than just rote learning. Um, and you know this the, the teaching at the right level just focuses on getting each child from where they are to where they need to be in terms of actual mastery incorporation into their acquired capabilities, um, the foundational skills that children need to succeed, both later in school as well as in life. Um, and so I think this just requires an, a, a system focus on first things first. You need a system reform to make the system coherent for learning outcomes by strengthening accountability relationships around learning outcomes. The learning goals um, need to be really focused on what is it that every child needs to master and incorporate into their repertoire of acquired capabilities and how do we get to those to every child early. And that's gonna require a focus on teaching and teaching at the right level. So that's kind of the, out, the outline I wanted to sort of have a shift from an overambitious curriculum that essentially races ahead with thin exposure to lots of topics and lack of mastery of each and simultaneously acts as a selection system rather than a true education system. Land, there is a, there's a lot to unpack. Um, you know, <laughs> too many ideas um, right from teaching at the right level to comments about, uh, you know, too much is taught, to curriculum races ahead at higher pace than children do. Year on year, uh, the research shows 
that the learning curve has flattened for a substantial chunk of our students and that a steep learning curve is possible when the conceptual mastery is attained at early grades. There's a, there's, there's a lot to unpack there. But, but before I go to other panelists and we will go to them in just a moment, Land, here is an important, one of the many things that stood out to me uh, is how you have sought to flip the very discussion or very discourse that we have in India. For example, there's a standard discourse that we have and I'm as much a part of it is that uh, reports after reports show that I learned other children are many, many years behind their curricular expectations. But you're flipping the discussion. You are saying that the curriculum, uh, you're not asking, we're asking why are students behind, but you're asking why is curriculum ahead? And that, that's a very different mental orientation or a very different approach uh, towards the same same problem, both in understanding, diagnosing, and, and then, of course, intervention. Is that, would you say, an accurate a sense uh, from what you were saying or what the paper is? Yes, absolutely. I, I think, um, you know, you, you, yeah, you have to do what you can do. And, you know, while stretch <laughs> targets are good, um, stretch can only work so far. You know, I sometimes illustrate it with my students by putting a rubber band between my fingers and saying, if I move my fingers further apart with the rubber band in place, um, that creates pressure and that stretch target can be good for moving things. But if I pull my fingers too far apart, the rubber band snaps. And essentially in India, in the current context, the rubber band snapped. The connection between the actually achievable skills that you could get to children with the, with the resources and system that you have and what the curriculum is demanding is just unrealistic. And so you can't make the current system deliver in any way uh, universal mastery of the curriculum you have. You have to focus, you have to focus. And this isn't, again, this is the opposite of dumbing down. This is smartening up. Smartening up means we want children to actually master the conceptual foundations of what they're learning. That's a smarter curriculum, not a dumber curriculum. Um, but the current, you know, these aren't stretch targets. You know, asking me to fly around the room is not a stretch target. I can't do it. Um, you know, so so I think the the the, the you know the the high performing systems that Lucy talks about don't attempt, in fact, to deliver all of what is in the Indian curriculum. Uh, at one point in some paper, I don't remember now, I uh, you know actually compared the Indian curriculum to the curricular standards of systems that perform at much higher levels, um, both in equity and average, and they, they actually have much tighter, narrower curriculum. The, 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 you know, the minimum skills that at one point were promoted in India had like 144 targets for great fourth graders that were just completely unrealistic relative to what actually could be delivered in a mastery sense. So let me ask the same question uh, and let me turn to you, um, Dr. Banha. Would you say the curriculum is, is over ambitious or uh, are our teachers underprepared? Uh, my name is Banha and I'll be responding to that question. Um, in Singapore, over the years, we have been consciously trying to cut down on curricular goals. I'm speaking mostly um, using mathematics as an example, that's my area of expertise, uh, to the point where in 2004, we coined a slogan, teach less, learn more. So it is necessary for the curriculum to be written in such a way that teachers see the interconnectedness between and among the outcomes. If you give them a laundry list of things they need to teach, that will be problematic. So I think uh, what we hear a while ago is absolutely true. It is essential that any system uh, should have a rather tight curriculum, a few important big ideas to be mastered by students. Yeah, so that is necessary, regardless of the quality of teachers. 
that's absolutely fair. Uh, uh, must, mastery at early years and mastery of few concepts. But Pranav, let me let me turn to you. And uh, you know, in India, we have national curriculum framework. We have NCRT and the SCRT textbooks. For for the international audience, NCRT and SCRT are the principal academic bodies that write textbooks in India. So we have national curriculum framework. We have NCRT and SCRT textbooks. Uh, has there been any analysis about how aligned or mapped are our textbooks to the very curriculum framework that already exists for us? Uh, would you be able to confidently state that they're aligned? Yeah, so I think, uh, Anurag, I think the textbook uh, writers actually take a fair bit of care to sort of make sure the textbooks are aligned. I mean, there is the framework and then every state sort of, you know, makes its own uh, curricular thing and then the textbooks are mapped to the state uh, thing. So I think that part is there. So I, I don't think the issue per se is on the textbooks as front or even from the framework uh, as such. I think the there is right now just an emphasis on delivery of the curriculum, right? So a teacher's sort of main KRA is to go there and deliver a lesson. Now, we don't know how much of that is absorbed by the students and the teacher's bosses are just asking, did you make a lesson plan? Did you, you know, finish this lesson? Did you teach this lesson? But they are not holding the teacher accountable on whether their students have actually learned the lesson. So I think that fundamental shift from, you know, delivery uh, to absorption by the child is what is missing um, and and uh, yeah, I think you know high quality assessments can capture that um, and give us that result on what students have learned, and teachers can use that information to then calibrate on what is it that they teach tomorrow, the week after, the year after. Okay, uh, Amit, uh, you were involved in the drafting of the right to education in your early days. Uh, uh, when you were in, at the uh, Ministry of Human Resource and Development, which is now called Ministry of Education. Now, right to education uh, uh, prescribes certain duties for the teacher. Now, our obsession for syllabus completion is such that we have now codified it into a law. If you can help us understand, and particularly because you've, you've had multiple roles in education, you have been a school uh, head, you have been in private consulting firms, you have also been uh, in, in the MHRD. So help us understand from your experiences that despite there being a strong body of evidence and honestly, much of what we heard so far and, and what the paper of, of Land Pritchard says sounds fairly obvious to me that, that teach little, but teach it really uh, in depth. So despite there being a strong body of evidence and what sounds commonsensical to me, why is our culture such obsessed uh, about syllabus completion? What's your experience? Well, I think the whole uh, completion of syllabus, completion of the curriculum as, as it is provided for in the Right to Education Act is a good example of how good intentions can have bad outcomes. Uh, I think I, I agree with what, what Blant was saying. Ultimately, the issue begins when schools are set up in, a, in accordance with the sort of age and grade structure. It's because we tag kids at a certain age to a certain grade, and then we have a curriculum that is delivered, a high quality curriculum that is delivered uh, in a manner which we consider to be age and grade appropriate. That's where the challenge actually begins. Um, the 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 intent of uh, a curry of of the act saying that the curriculum should be completed within the school year was essentially to make sure that all kids receive the same opportunity to do that curriculum and to complete it during the academic year but the truth is that this there's an implicit assumption here which is that all kids are at the same level in each grade and that's never the case you will usually have a situation where the best 10, the top 10% in a classroom are five or six years ahead of the bottom 10%. And so, and, and as Land pointed out, what happens is teaching tends to happen at, at the level which is sort of most common or indeed in some cases to the, to the, to the top percentage uh, of the class. Uh, and those kids who are therefore behind get left behind. So they start behind they never get a chance to catch up. And as time goes by, it becomes that much more difficult for them to, to, to reach where everybody else is. So 
So the whole idea of having a curriculum, which is structured to a certain age level and a certain grade level gets defeated. What we've started doing is actually looking at learning as, or uh, uh, looking at learning as, as you would look at say music, for example, when you start to say, learn the guitar or the piano or any, any musical instrument or, or to sing, you don't actually say, all right, it's year one of my learning. So I must now be able to play a solo like Eric Clapton. It doesn't work like that. You move to the next level when you're ready for it. You go through the practice that's required. You go through the learning of the fundamentals, and then you move gradually from one level to another as you are ready. Now, if you start to look at academic curriculum in a similar fashion, then you have a very different way of looking at it. I mean, I'm going to disagree with something that Pranav said a little while ago, that teachers need to be held accountable for how much kids have learned. My problem is this word accountability has actually caused half the problems that we cut, or probably more than half the problems that we deal with, which is the teacher's accountable for completing the curriculum, the teacher's accountable for learning, the teacher's accountable for the midday meal, the teacher's accountable for everything. So when we talk about delivering learning to kids at the level at which they are and ensuring mastery, there is another aspect to this, which is that of making sure the teachers are empowered to be able to do so. And by asking for accountability at every stage, we've actually disempowered them. So we've, we've gone backwards. If we start to say we need to make teachers accountable for uh, kids having learned, you'll start to see fudging in the, in the learning assessment reports. So that doesn't help us. So short, point, uh, short answer to your question, really. I think the act had good intentions. It was looking at trying to make sure that all kids got, the, got an equal opportunity to learn the same things and to progress in the same way. But it forgot to take into account the fact that kids in each classroom are at very different levels. I think perhaps not only uh, it, it forgot to take into account that the kids are at different uh, starting levels, it also forgot to take into account that uh, not all children consume or absorb the same amount of learning, even when the instruction for them is the same. The resource around them is the same. Oh, absolutely. And the other, the other challenge here is that assessments also don't reflect this. So uh, for, a, for a, a child in grade three or grade five who does the same standard, again, we're making the same mistake with assessments as we do with curriculum. The kid does the same standard assessment that is applied to everybody. So there's an, there's an expectation of meeting certain curricular goals. And that's, that's what the assessment is based on. Uh, but the truth is that those assessments don't measure, for example, how far a child who was much further behind than the rest of the grade has actually progressed during the year, even if he's not necessarily meeting curricular expectation. So we, we compound the mistake by looking at assessments also uh, from the standpoint of being able to meet certain curricular goals. I mean, you've raised two very important points, uh, and I'll return to, to both of them in just a while. But before that, let, let's go to Dr. Jeremy. Uh, Dr. Jeremy, you are a professor of mathematics. Now, mathematics uh, breeds fear in children. Uh, it's, it's one of the contributors to, to drop out and to low self-esteem. Uh, Pratham's uh, annual status education report uh, points out that nearly 75% of our grade five children cannot perform basic division. Do you think similar issues exist for mathematics too? Uh, and if yes, how do you reconcile the struggle uh, that how do we achieve mastery while ensuring minimum learning for all, particularly for mathematics, which, which uh, is so worrying for everyone? Um, thank you. Uh, I mean, I, I, I think uh, just to agree with some of the panelists, uh, I, I, I fully agree with Lance's point about focusing on teaching and focusing on teaching at the right level and focusing on challenge. Um, mathematics um, is often understood as just being about rote learning and shallow procedures. Actually, what we've got to do with mathematics is enable pupils to have a, a kind of holistic understanding of mathematics not just to be able to do procedures, 
but to be able to reconstruct those procedures when they forget them, uh, to have some uh, degree of conceptual knowledge, for example, to, uh, to know that a thousand is, is 10 times a hundred. It's not just an extra, an, extra, an extra digit. And they've got to have some um, fluency with, uh, with uh, strategies to know which mental calculation to do uh, a, for, for, a, for, a, for a particular calculation. And finally, for facts, they don't just need to know the facts, they need to know that those facts connect up. That uh, eight times seven is actually, you can work it out from seven times seven, and you can work out what 49 divided by seven is by knowing a multiplication fact. All of those things are, are, are need, to, need, need some degree of focus. Um, and require us to, um, uh, to, to focus on, on, on those things. I'm not sure if that's answered that question. Um. No, absolutely fair. But uh, Jeremy, uh, some of what you pointed out requires uh, much greater time from the, from the teacher's side. And I think this could be a, a great moment to take one of the questions from, from a teacher who had sent in earlier uh, um, she works as a government school teacher um, in Delhi, and she said, uh, and uh, amid it connects to the point that you earlier made, kids or, or everyone else is making, the kids who get left behind, they stay behind. And sometimes the gap extends to even several years of, of where the learning gains stand with respect to various children, leading to a very diverse differential classroom. Now, this teacher uh, asks that uh, I have students in my classroom uh, that cannot do basic reading. And I have children in my classroom who can read fluently. How am I expected to teach? Lucy, you have been a teacher. Would you like to take that? So I, I think in terms of what the, the long-term goals might be for India and in terms of what is needed in the short term, those are two very different things. Um, if you're already in a situation as a teacher is where you've got very different abilities within a classroom, then you do need to do grouping. You do need to give um, different types of work and different teaching to those different groups um, because they won't all be able to access the same thing. Um, and that, that's completely appropriate. The, the, the trouble is, the, or the, the danger is rather, is if that becomes so systemic that it just becomes, oh, well, these, child, these children can't access a curriculum, so we put them in a corner and they just get on with another task, that's where it becomes problematic. If the goal is let's, let's put these students in different groups, you know, set, do, do, do some general teaching, set this group off on an activity, and then I'm gonna give my focus to this group who need extra help, then that, that is appropriate if you're trying to bring them along and help them to catch up. Um, but that's, you know, that's, there's, that's what's needed now in India. There are, because there are these huge, huge disparities, you do need to do some grouping so that you can teach to the correct level. Um, I, I'd be interested actually to hear what Banha has to say about this in terms of um, whole class teaching with children of, of different abilities. Um, but I think you know, grouping within a class is appropriate. In the, the longer term though, in terms of what are the systems doing that, that keep these differences to a minimum, that is, fundamentally, you know, putting, investing in, in um, the early years, as the NEP suggests, that is crucial, because if you have that, children start all able, or the majority able to access grade one. If you take the approach that Lanta is suggesting with, with curricula and focus, which is certainly what top performing systems do, then most of them can keep up. And then the gap, the, there still are gaps, but the gaps are smaller and they're easier to address. So there's, there's two different challenges, really. That's the short term challenge of how do you deal with the gaps that already exist, which I think is, a, is partly a pedagogical challenge. And then there's a the long term goal, which is how do we make sure those gaps don't get as big as they are, which is more of a structural challenge. But how, how, uh, how do you how does uh, your school cater to varying needs and pace of, of learning of children? I will offer one. Uh, approach we often use, what mathematics educators often refer to as using a low floor, high ceiling task. I'm borrowing the words of Joe Bowler. So a low floor, high ceiling task is low floor, hence accessible to the beginners in the class. And it has a high ceiling. That means your more advanced learners continue to be challenged. Uh, an example of a low floor, high ceiling task 
in mathematics would be say in a a lesson where they are presented with a problem uh, there are three bunches of flowers in one bunch there are seven in a second bunch there are three and in the third bunch there are two flowers essentially seven and three and two just adding the three numbers up so for the true beginners that's operating at perhaps not even grade one level or grade one level uh, they would be counting counting all to get the total to get the sum the slightly more advanced ones if i can use that word would be counting but counting on perhaps not counting the seven anymore but counting on from seven and the average learners in grade one class would be making 10 a more conceptual approach being able to see that seven and three is 10 and 10 and two is 12 and those who are slightly a little bit ahead might even be able to see that oh i could rearrange the flowers into three bunches of fours three fours i could rearrange the seven three and two by getting some from the seven in to make three fours and that might spark an avalanche of ideas from other friends in the class that say well i could also see seven three and two as two sixes and others would chip in or i could see four trees and yet others could say six twos you probably appreciate that's multiplicative in nature already so while even as a teacher is doing adding the more advanced learners are challenged into thinking something that's considered a little bit advanced for that group of children and if you have minor geniuses in that class they may even appreciate that the three numbers you gave them are prime numbers and oh how interesting that i can write 12 as a sum of three prime numbers and they might be wondering could i also have written other numbers like 11 or 10 or 9 and so on as a sum of three prime numbers so you can see that that is pretty low for i can get the sum by counting and yet if counting is too easy i can make 10 and if addition is too easy i could think about multiplicative structures and if all that arithmetic is too easy i can begin to play around with conjectures around prime numbers so uh, that's my response uh, one way to cater to that wide range of students within a mixed ability class is the use of low floor high ceiling class that's my response now a, a very very interesting uh, principle i must say and, and i think very well articulated uh, using an example um, uh, Thank you very much for that, uh, Banha. But here is my uh, reflection when you were speaking. Um, how do we get our millions and millions of teachers, and before that, uh, those who take decisions with respect to those uh, teachers, think as deeply as you just did? We will come to that question uh, and perhaps pose it to the rest of the panelists. But before that, let's take a question from one of the audience. Dr. Khalik Ahmed has raised his hand. Uh, Dr. Khalik Ahmed, if you can switch on your video and audio and ask your question and request you to please keep your question brief. Yeah. Dr. Khalik, yeah. are we yeah. ready? I, I, can't, yes. uh, I can't open my video. It's switched off oh. by you, I think. See yeah. if you can or else you can go ahead. You're perfectly audible to us. Fine. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kundu. Uh, going back to your... Uh, uh, observation about alignment between national curriculum framework and the textbooks. Uh, see, I'm a slow learner, so I'm going back to work. Right? Uh, what about the NCF itself? What I believe personally is that NCF itself is too ambitious. And the content part is so much in the textbooks, in the curriculum, that actually it fails to be delivered within the stipulated time. Say, for example, in English, we have 20 chapters to be finished. Uh, there is so much to be finished in English, but the little learning is happening. So what about uh, the take of the panelists on national curriculum framework being too ambitious itself? Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Khalik, for that question. Um, anyone? Pranav, would you like uh, to take I, a shot? 
I can try to respond to that. Please, um, please go ahead, Dr. Banhao. Um, yes, in any system, uh, that's a common problem. Too many topics listed in a textbook. What is important is teachers understand the big idea in those chapters. For example, if you go to grade six or grade seven textbooks, there'll be chapters on area of all sorts of polygons and circles. But if teachers understand that all they are doing in those many, many chapters or lessons, whether it's area of trapezium, trapezoid, area of kite, area of triangle, area of circle, area of rhombus, and all sorts, actually all they are doing is helping students understand that they are converting the various shapes into rectangle and then apply what they know about rectangles area finding to find your area of rhombus or kites. For example, if you have, say, a triangle, you can perhaps, if it's a right angled triangle, you can take two copies of those, two congruent ones, and then form a rectangle. And once you know the base and the height, you, you know the area of the rectangle. And afterwards, you half it to get whatever you want. Or likewise, if you have a kite, you can cut the kite along the di diagonals and rearrange the four pieces into a rectangle. And similarly with circles, you can cut the circles into tiny slices and try to rearrange those slices to form an approximate rectangle. And from the knowledge of the circumference and radius, you. so what I'm trying to say is that if teachers understand that the many chapters allude to one big idea, they will no longer worry about completing everything because those are mere case studies to learn that same big idea, which is using what I know, area of rectangle, to do what I don't know, area of rhombus or trapezium and so on. So I think uh, in response to that question, uh, what I'm trying to say is that teachers, teaching subjects need to be helped to understand big ideas behind what, what they are teaching. Pranav, would, would you like to add? I, I think, you know, frameworks are guidelines. Um, I, I think the, the biggest uh, elephant in the room right now is building more capacity uh, in the system to be able to then deliver on the foundational literacy and numeracy skills that are being talked about, right? So I think more uh, important is does do teachers have access to, you know, what are the top misconceptions that children have for every grade, uh, for every subject? Um, why do those children think a particular way? Uh, and what are some proven strategies uh, that could actually help them in the classroom to remediate that? Uh, today, a teacher is walking into the classroom with basically no data, or even if data exists, it's a, it exists at a very high level, um, you know, either at the district block or state level, uh, or even just a simple percentage that only 40% students know this, right? What that is not very useful. So even if any of us were to walk into a classroom and we knew that based on prior assessments that were done and pedagogic research that was done, that when you're going in to teach, you know, area of an irregular shape, uh, students are only answering uh, based on formula that they know. Or when you are comparing decimals, students think that 2.35 is bigger than 2.6 because it's longer. Right? If you know, uh, if you have a catalog of these list of misconceptions children have, what are the answers they give? What percentage of the students give what answers? And how can you remediate this in the classroom? If this information is available to them in easy to understand form and just in time as they are preparing for a class uh, in the next few days, then they would be able to uh, remediate that. So, so I think that is where the focus of the system has to be to support the teachers to build that capacity. I think you know, the curriculum framework per se might be okay. It's sort of what we do with it that's far more important. No, absolutely correctly pointed out. Uh, and I think, uh, Dr. Jeremy, you, you are based in the Department uh, of, of Pedagogy, Curriculum Pedagogy and Assessment. And the consistent theme that is emerging is that the teacher needs to be supported and helped. 
and to to understand uh, things for example as as profoundly as as dr banhar explained about and uh, getting the main concept and then use the main concept to syn- that synthesis of knowledge to to delve deeper so how do we or, or what's your learning what are some of the best practices that uh, that are there uh, across the world that you might have come across how do we support our teachers um well i i, I think in um a first strategy is to is to do the same thing for teaching as we're talking about for children slow down in order to speed up don't set the expectations too high um and a a, a second a second aim is is to do what the last two speakers have have talked about one is is about connecting up knowledge increasing the granularity so that we have big ideas and understanding understanding some of the difficulties that um, the the children uh, the children face what can we do about that well um, lucy in her initial presentation talked about lesson study about teachers working together to figure out ways of ways of teaching collaborating on ways of teaching and developing developing good explanations developing good tasks starting to see how those tasks connect up to uh, to uh, to to mathematical ideas so teachers working together uh, uh, can uh, uh, can help there um, in in terms of what else has helped well in 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 england uh, about 20 years ago, we had a major uh, reform of, of mathematics education in the National Numeracy Strategy, which was focused on um, uh, was focused on pr- primary mathematics and uh, in, in increasing children's attainment in primary mathematics. Where did we start? We started by training school principals. So that school principals understood what was going on in the classroom and what was being required of their teachers. And then they could support, support those teachers. And that, that kind of matches with um, the, the, one of the key principles of the Delhi reform, focusing on, on, on leadership, but not just focusing on system leadership, but focusing on leadership within schools. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, All right, can I come, can I just come in here for yes. a second? I think, I don't disagree with what's being said, uh, but the challenge for us coming back to the Indian context, the challenge for us is that all of this, whether it's about having teachers come together and do peer learning and think about best lessons and, or whether it's about um, enabling principals and teachers to think about how mathematics should be taught uh, well in the classroom. The challenge with all of this is the issue of teacher autonomy and teacher empowerment. And that's where this all comes unstuck. Uh, I'm gonna go back to a program that was run in the early nineties in India called the District Primary Education Program. It was the first uh, large scale education program that was, that was run in India with funding from the World Bank and various other development partners. One of the concepts there was the concept of having uh, cluster resource centers and block resource centers. Uh, and the idea behind these and, and, and mandating that every month teachers in the cluster, so um, for our non-Indian guests, um, the country is divided into states, each state is further divided into districts, the districts are divided into blocks. And a group of five, seven villages would in the block would normally be a cluster. Uh, so the idea behind having these cluster resource centers and the block resource centers was that teachers would once a month get together and talk about exactly what Lucy just said, the kinds of problems that they face in classroom, the, the, the difficult things that, that need help or just bounce ideas off each other, et cetera, et cetera. Now, how is that being used today? How that's being used today is that that becomes a monthly meeting for data collection. So there is actually no peer discussion. There is no peer peer sharing. It's all about 
have you the cluster resource center coordinator is looking at whether the villages have collected the data that is required the block resource center is looking at whether the clusters have done that and so on upwards to the state so we've distorted the system completely uh if we're going to talk about this kind i, I i'll take another example and this one is really current um I saw from today's newspaper and I was rather surprised to see it because the right to education act actually says that teachers shall not be deployed for non teaching duties other than census and an election. I see from today's newspaper that because we've got this bird flu scare on in 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 India that teachers are being deployed as part of teams that are that are deployed to the border to check for vehicles bringing in chicken produce. So live chicken fresh birds uh slaughtered birds etc cetera, etc cetera. so there's a team of three people and one of them is a teacher i don't understand why but aside from my not understanding why the fact remains that when we use teachers in this manner and this typically happens in the government space because teachers form one of the largest groups of government employees and so it's very easy to deploy them for for miscellaneous government duties when we do this kind of thing and we send them off to to data collection and chicken surveys and things like that how do we expect them to develop to develop the kind of autonomy that we're discussing here absolutely uh, a point well taken and, and well made uh, i will you know you talked of teacher autonomy or the, or the leadership uh, the the running joke uh, that we have is uh, there is no department of education in our country it's at best a department of education logistics uh and which is actually a fair bit articulation of of where we stand but uh i will come to with the question of assessment design because consciously or subconsciously that's the one institutional uh, way of in uh, significantly influencing what a teacher teach how much a teacher uh, te- how much a teacher teaches at what pace i i will come to that question of assessment design and specifically to you pranav but before that land if i might come to you you know Sorry Anurag can I just interrupt you for one second before please, you go please. to land it's just been brought to my attention that the the business of sending teachers to borders for chicken survey has been uh, has been uh, stopped so so that I stand corrected that was the morning's newspaper report but apparently the deputy chief minister has decided against it yeah absolutely so uh, uh, i think remedial action undertaken <laughs> so so land if if i might come to you uh, you know the heaviness uh, of the curriculum or the burden of the curriculum has long been debated and discussed uh, in india as well could you from your research uh, or, or other researchers uh, help us understand is there a difference between learning gain when students are expected to attain different standards uh, i mean if let's say in one particular context if i i'm expected to attain certain standards and the standards are lower in terms of expectation somewhere else so what influence does that have on the learning gains so i i would not start with the word lower or higher <laughs> i would start maybe with deeper in the sense of assessments uh you know bad assessments drive bad teaching So if you set up a system in which the student is rewarded for and expected to complete rote learning answer a wide variety of questions without understanding then it's and you make that high stakes it's not going to be surprising that the system aligns itself uh and there's parental demand for children doing well on an assessment so i 100% agree that, that you know you you can't reform the teaching system without reforming the assessment system um uh because but then you know i i resist anything i'm saying is being interpreted as having lower standards we're not having lower it isn't lower standards we're having standards that are clear about conceptual mastery and what most high stakes examination systems currently do is not assess conceptual mastery they assess breadth of exposure to be able to reproduce certain rote things so in the example i showed in my presentation you know 
you were getting a fair amount of mastery of, you know, if I present you an arithmetic addition problem in exactly the way you saw it in the textbook, can you reproduce it on an assessment? But, uh, and this is again, the net education initiatives in India has been at the forefront of, you know, how would one do assessment differently so that we really probe conceptual mastery? And I think sophisticated assessment systems start to pose an array of questions where we can get to, are students really mastering the underlying concept rather than just being able to wrote reproduce, you know, I've shown you, uh, you know, I've shown you a, an example where length is measured with a pencil and then on the exam length is measured with some other object, but it's still, you know, the, the, the base of the object is still on zero and there's nothing. So anyway, so I, I think clearly, you know, you, you have, if you have high stakes assessments, uh, they are going to become the focus. And I think part of the reason teachers feel pressured in the current system to deliver the curriculum, and I love the idea of delivering the curriculum. It's like, hey, I stood up there and said it, it was delivered, whether the student actually learned anything from it is their problem. But you know, part of the pressure to deliver the curriculum is that then the high stakes assessment assesses you know, exposure to a curriculum. So I think the assessment problem and the accountability problem are deeply in, integrated. And could I say, I, I wanna say one thing that's kind of emerged here. Um, you know, there is a tension between autonomy, uh, autonomy and some versions of accountability. And in our kind of research, we, we wanna emphasize, what I wanna emphasize is there's accounting-based accountability and there's account-based accountability. Really true high-performing professional systems rely on what I call account-based accountability, which is the person gives an account of who they are, what they did, why they did it, in a, in a way in which they justify their actions as achieving a purpose. That is compatible with large degrees of autonomy, right? If we look at surgeons, if we look at high-performing architects, if we look at other professions, they don't rely on narrow kind of top-down driven logistical type accountability, which is what we call thin input accountability. They require on thick descriptions of how was I acting and how were the ways in which I was acting consistent with achieving the goals and what's the mapping between my understanding and what I did. And so, you know, we need accountability, but I think India is has gone too far in some ways in the narrow accounting based accountability. And as um, Amit was saying, you know, we've distorted the roles of the local level intermediaries from rather than being support to teachers to you know, give an account of and be more empowered to deliver a shared conception of purpose of what learning is, they've been distorted into you know, top-down mechanisms of extracting data. So I'm fully on board with accountability of the accounting type can go too far and kill rather than enable um, true, high, true high performance. But an accounting-based accountability starts from the presumption that individuals need to act with autonomy to achieve goals. And if we get clarity of goals, support to those to the individuals for those goals, we can have both a high performing, high autonomy and high accountability system. Absolutely. Uh, you know, uh, since accountability and assessments are so intricately linked, Pranav, uh, what would you say needs to change about our, how we assess uh, our students? Yeah, I think the first is what Land mentioned as, you know, the types of questions that we are asking. Um, so India probably has one of the most rote-based assessments. And there was this study uh, done by Dr. Newman Burde where he uh, looked at India, Pakistan, two African countries, and a Canadian one. And he found that some of the Indian assessments were actually worse than even the African ones and, you know, way below the Canadian ones. And then he's done a very systematic um, sort of taxonomy uh, linking and, and it's a published paper in RISE where, which Lant actually chairs globally. Um, so I, so, you know, our questions, what do I mean by road-based questions, right? So our questions are asking things like, what is the definition of photosynthesis? Or it's asking, you know, please explain 
triangle ABC is congruent to PQR, and that's you know verbatim taken from the textbook. So the only skills that the assessments in India today are testing are whether you can memorize, whether you can remember facts and figures, whether you can reproduce exact diagrams that were published in the textbooks, and all of this without even knowing what is the underlying concept or whether you've truly understood uh, that part. Which is why when you know India takes a test like the PISA, which is a perfectly valid test, right? Uh, but sort of is really probing and checking for it. Uh, we stood second last in the world. So to me, I think the quality of the question that is being asked uh, in our assessments will have a ripple effect uh, in the entire system. See, some of the good things in India are that as a country, we really value education, right? Parents are prioritizing the spending on education. Um, as a culturally, I think India sort of, you know, every the whole system is geared towards valuing and supporting education, which is why there's so much private spending on education as well. Unfortunately, the goalpost is, you know, to sort of score more marks, which by itself is not bad, but because of the question paper itself is sort of bad. You know, teaching to the test is not bad if the test itself is very good, right? And the skills that are required to get more marks on that uh, is very good. So I think if we just change the goalpost, we're going to actually harness the entire energy we have. We're going to channelize it towards, you know, all of those things. I, I, I do think that structurally many of those things are in place. So, yeah, when questions are, you know, also throwing up insights. Um, so when we have actually carefully analyzed the responses that students get, we are able to uh, rank order them in terms of the frequency of occurrence of the most common wrong answer. Uh, and then by talking to the students, uh, we actually uncover why is it that they picked it. Now, this requires careful item design, it requires sort of looking at the data uh, option wise or, you know, uh, whatever the a child wrote in a non MCQ basis, uh, talking to the students, sometimes even referring global literature search, uh, which is published in the Journal of Research of Maths Education, for example. And then all of this, uh, because you have large scale data, high quality question and education pedagogy, you can then provide teachers insights uh, from what assessments have shown up, which then allows them to, you know, teach that concept better. Um, so that's, uh, you know, in a way that I think improving the assessments will have a ripple effect, positive ripple effect on improved uh, teaching learning processes and finally learning outcomes. You know, uh, we are a very uh, exam oriented or obsessed uh, country. And, you know, it's best reflected in our current times when the whole year we haven't taught our students pretty much anything. I'm, and I'm not discounting the wonderful work teachers have worked uh, uh, to ensure whatever little they can teach through very, various digital means without discounting the hard work that they've done. Uh, we are hellbent on when will CBS exams be held next? And I am like, what will you and why will you test students when you haven't taught anything for the whole year? And we are that exam oriented or obsessed society. I think in that context, um, Pranav, a lot of questions uh, that we're getting on YouTube and, and the chat box here relates to the assessment design. And which is why I'll push you a little further. You said uh, our assessment design is worse than many, many countries. And at a principal level, I completely uh, uh, agree. And I don't think anybody will dispute uh, as far as principal or conceptual level is concerned. Sorry. And you know, just a minor clarification, the quality of the questions in the exams is... Yeah, the quality of the questions uh, is, is worse in many countries. So at a principal and conceptual level, uh, there's hardly ever been a dispute and we completely understand. Can you give some operational examples of what that means? As to that, this is the kind of questions that we ask, and this is the different kind of questions are being asked in in other countries. Can can you, as a teacher uh, who's listening to this talk, help what you said at a principal level into operations? Sure. So you know we are asking lots of uh, facts about when was a certain battle fought, or what was the name of you know so and so's parents, or where were they born, or, or many of those things, right? But uh, if instead we could sort of, uh, let's say, uh, put pictures of uh, architectural uh, nuances that we have seen in a certain form of an architecture and ask children to recognize that, or if we sort of look at uh, when some of the important um, scientific principles uh, in daily life uh, have been used, right? So as opposed to asking the definition of photosynthesis, if one were to ask, you know, what happens when... 
uh, when plants are in sunlight and how do they produce their energy and have a richer understanding of that. Like we see that sometimes we ask that if there's a wooden spoon, there's a metal spoon, um, uh, and then there is, let's say, uh, uh, in, like a copper spoon versus uh, uh, which of them would get heated fastest when you put them into a hot boiling liquid, right? And why would you use uh, a wooden spoon as opposed to a metal spoon? Right? So questions like those, which are connected to real life, uh, which requires you to understand what's happening in the conduction of uh, uh, heat uh, or electricity in other cases, uh, and that causes uh, children to think differently. Um, for example, in, on weights, right? We find that children are not able to understand that uh, 250 gram weight plus uh, one kilogram weight uh, versus let's say an object that is uh, one and a half kilos that like which one of them uh, would be heavier, right? And those are all questions that are connected to real life requires you to conceptually understand many of those things and, and questions like that. I think in the Indian exam system right now, it's become a pattern recognition system. So what happens is when a student looks at a question, the student is thinking, where have I seen this question before? In that question, what operations did I did? And now I want to try to solve it, right? Whereas in, a, in high quality questions, uh, the pattern recognition itself is not found and you have to sort of think of all the principles that you know and apply them. And many of those cases, the background context and all enabling data to solve the question is there. It's just not a replica of, you know, a pattern that you may have seen before, uh, you know, at the back of a textbook. So that's the change that we would need. We really want to solve uh, the question and the, the daily life joke uh, now is uh, uh, just give us the problem statement and we'll just somehow prove it. Uh, we'll just somehow prove LHS is equal to RHS. That's mm -hmm. a standard mathematical question. Jeremy, yeah, uh, you last 10 please years. go ahead. Or if you just solve the last 10 years papers, you are assured, yeah. that, you know, the passing marks, right? Absolutely. <laughs> just have. Uh, no yes. Jeremy? Um, just to add to that, introduce some unpredictability to your tests so that, uh, so that you have to think when you answer the, answer the questions. Um, uh, as has been said, you need to think about misconceptions because those can inform what, what teachers do. Uh, look to PISA, look at the kind of questions that, that PISA use. I think it's also uh, useful to think about the example of Singapore. In, in, in the UK, we often look at, at Singapore and some uh, of our educationalists criticize uh, Singapore teachers for teaching to the test. Um, and someone, someone has already said about teaching to the test isn't a problem if it's the right test. The thing that impressed me about, about teachers in Singapore when I was there was that they understood the assessment and they spent a lot of time working together to figure out what was required for kids to do well on those on those test items. So they were teaching for the test, but in, in lots of ways they were teaching to the right test. And they were thinking about they were thinking about the assessment as a way of assessing, well, I was interested in mathematical knowledge, but it, it, it would apply to it would apply to other disciplines. Okay. Lucy, do you want to go ahead and then we'll take a question from an audience? Thank you. Yes, just I want to kind of um, tie everything that, that we've just been saying about assessment um, to supporting st supporting students to keep up because I think the, the the key link here is teacher guides in in my opinion uh, something else that I saw in Singapore. So going back to what um, Pranath was saying about um, if you can get teachers the the data about what are the common student misconceptions in a topic that they're teaching that are so useful for them, um, and going back again also to what Banha um, was the example Banha was giving about. Um, what kind of tasks can you use to bring lots of different students in? The, the um, what was it? The, lo the lo low ceiling, low floor, high ceiling. Um, forgive me if I've got that wrong. But is is having yeah, that right. having that knowledge in teachers' guides accessible on the desk? So example here, when I was in Singapore, um, I went into a lesson on um, it was on friction. Um, and uh, the students were all doing an, an activity where they were trying different uh, materials and rubbing them against each other and noting down how hard it was or easy. And open on the teacher's desk was a double spread. It was just quite a, th quite a thin book, not as thick as a textbook, one double spread that was uh, on friction and was all of that information, the really valuable information that the teacher could use there and then, even if the teacher hadn't planned the lesson, because it had 
you know, what are questions you can use to really get students thinking if they've already understood this, the kind of extension questions, what, um, what questions can you ask students to identify whether or not they still have this misconception? Um, what activities are going to be particularly engaging? And, and it's just there, as someone else said, it's, it's just in time, at their fingertips. Um, and it, perhaps an easier way to get it to them is in teacher guides as opposed to, um, uh, obviously teacher training is hugely, hugely important as well, but in terms of, of the when and how quickly you can do these things, having those teacher guides with teachers might, might support them in um, activities and questions that include all students in a classroom, despite varying um, ability levels in that subject. No, I, absolutely. I think uh, uh, teaching is probably one of the hardest job in the world and yet probably a uh, very uh, underrated uh, kind of a job. Uh, you know, we can take a question at this stage from Monica Jagota. Monica, are you there? Uh, thanks, Anurag. Uh, I'm very much here. Thank you so yes, much. Please go ahead. Uh, it's such a wonderful discussion that's going on. And I am really, you know, very impressed with this curriculum being a selection system versus being a learning system. So I would like to know what factors should be kept in mind while designing a curriculum that doesn't raise ahead of the students and at the same time enables them to achieve deeper levels of learning. And my second question is how many learning outcomes should be specified per class so that the teachers can actually deliver mastery? Sure. Um... Is your question to specific panelist or? Uh, sir, I think I would like to ask uh, Lan if he's around or anyone you want to ask. Lan and Banha, would you like to take a shot? Uh, yeah, I can try to answer that question uh, of curriculum design. I, I think an elegant curriculum. I will use mathematics as an example because that's really all I know, I think. Um, an elegant curriculum will often specify the basic building blocks, what I referred to earlier as a big idea. An example, regardless of what you do in time stable, never mind what time stable you are learning, you are learning basically three ideas. One is, how do you use, say, two groups of seven to do four groups of seven and hence eight group of seven? The idea of doubling. Secondly, how you use 10 times table, like 10 times eight to get nine times eight in case you don't yet remember nine times eight, the subtracting. And how you use the two and the fives to do the sevens. Like you can use two times six and five times six to figure out seven times six. So regardless of what times table you are teaching, you might be teaching two times table this week and then later the week three times table and later on four times table and next year the six, the seven and the eight and the nine times table. Never mind all that, you are teaching bot three ideas. So an elegant curriculum will have a small collection of big ideas that teachers need to deliver. Second, it will then encourage teachers to expose students to a wide range, a wide variety of problems, some of which are familiar, what I call near transfer, those that you typically would find in textbooks, but also the far transfer problems, okay, the, the unusual problems, to this. Or the, the novel problems. So, those are at least two things that will be in the curriculum document. The basic ideas and the encouragement of a wide variety of, of curriculum. I am not thinking of a curriculum in terms of how many bullet points or how many learning outcomes. That's just counting. But uh, really, uh, it should have big ideas and then encouragement for uh, both familiar problems, but also unfamiliar problems, unfamiliar uh, maybe also in terms of the complexity. So that's my response to that question. Thanks, Manha. Land? Um, so I think an important thing that has been said here a couple of times is connected to real life. 
I think one of the really severe problems with an overambitious curriculum is they don't recognize that really there is kind of common sense and common ways people actually carry out functionings. And the idea that schooling is meant to equip them with a broader set of capabilities that are enhanced functionings. And I think particularly first generation learners and disadvantaged children from disadvantage, they don't make the transition between common sense life and their regular life and what they're being taught in the curriculum and how this actually enhances their capability. So I, I go back, I had an ex education initiatives did this video of this example of measuring length where live they had a pencil and they had a ruler and the person was talking to a child and saying, how long is this pencil and put it, you know, with the base of the pencil on zero and the tip on six. And the child says, oh, it's six centimeters long. And then the researcher moved the pencil and said, how long is the pencil? And now the tip was on seven. And the child said seven. And the researcher moved it again and uh, said, okay, now the tip was on eight. How long is the pencil? And um, the child said, well, now it's eight. And the, the researcher said to the child, so you're telling me the pencil is getting longer as I move it. And in this video, you, you could just see the child head explode because he knew in common sense terms in his lived experience that objects don't get longer when you move them. <laughs> he knew a common sense language of what length meant, but had been taught in school, this school talk definition of length. And he wasn't really conceptually mastered the mapping between his real life and the tool he was trying to be given that would allow him to do more sophisticated things with a deeper conceptual understanding of length. So I would think if I were doing a and second example is, you know, my only teaching experience is not super relevant to the Indian and or primary school context because the only place I've really taught is Harvard uh, and that to graduate students. But even teaching to Harvard graduate students, what we found was if we taught them economics and gave them a problem set that asked for economics, they gave us economics. But if we gave them the world, a problem in the world, they didn't actually give us the economics, even after we thought we had taught it. And so what we designed is a capability-driven curriculum and curriculum framework where we said, what capabilities do we want the students when they're confronted with real world problems what repertoire of skills do we want to enable them to deploy against those problems? And we found the only way to really assess and develop a curriculum was to start with the capabilities we wanted the students to be able to deploy and use in real life and work backwards to what the learning outcomes were. So I think, again, uh, what the previous speaker was saying about big ideas, we, the curriculum should be framed in terms of what are the capabilities the student is acquiring and how would we expect the student to be able to deploy those capabilities in real life situations? Um, so we bring together, um, you, know, the, 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 <laughs> you know, the student understanding of why they're doing what they're doing. Um, you know, because students, you know, fractions are in a mathematical thing that often provide, <laughs> or, you know, a, uh, I don't know what the opposite of a gateway drug is. It's a closing the door thing. Students just never mas master fractions and then everything built on that. And in part, it's because they're not, I think, taught of how to deploy fractions to solve real world problems they face. So anyway, that was a long answer to, I would really focus a curriculum on capabilities that you want the student to be able to deploy. And then how would I mo mo move backwards towards curricular processes and learning outcome definitions that are building towards uh, a capability um, that is geared around real life things that students are going to, to confront. Um, and then with that conceptual foundation, that also provides a much firmer foundation for building in the academic sense. Uh, just to follow up, Land, um, do you think the textbooks uh, further expand the disconnect with real life? I can't say. Uh -huh. I, I haven't looked at the textbook in enough detail to make a. I don't, yeah. wanna, I don't know. 
Anurag, so, so, can... me... yes, Pranam, go ahead. I just wanted to take one, you know, maybe like two minutes of people's time because Land has mentioned this two, three times, just so for the rest of the audience to be aware of the example. So if it's with your permission, just wanted to share my screen and uh, quickly just show people like what Land was referring to. Um, so this is the question that, you know, we have asked um, to uh, multiple, um, you know, students across India in a variety of different languages, um, you know, which is the length uh, of the pencil, right? And what we find is that the correct answer is obviously five, but only about, you know, 11% students uh, get it right. The vast majority of them uh, pick six um, and so we have asked different variations of the questions where, you know, the question is now going from four to seven and uh, I mean, it's still five centimeter long pencil. And we find that constantly, uh, you know, children like what Land was saying, some answered nine, but a majority of them still answered six. And, and we were very perplexed by this. So what we did is we actually went and talked to the students and asked them to explain why did they think the answer is you know, six, and this is what uh, they sort of told us. That and that's why you said that yeah. it's eight. Yeah. And uh, not because this point is eight? No. This four will count as one, and till nine it will be six. This is one, two, three, four, five, six. We not see how much it, uh, there is. Start from six because it starts from four, four, one, 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 two, three, four, five, six. This to this is one centimeter. Yeah. And this to this? That is zero centimeter. This is zero centimeter. How much is this, uh, this to this? Two centimeters. Okay, so this much is two centimeter? No. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, and how much is this? Five centimeters. M is here and the answer is six because it's starting from here. One, two, three, four, five, six. And the ending point is here. Yeah, thanks. Just wanted to... You know, you know, a lot, lot to unpack, particularly about what happens in the mind of a child when she is seeking to master a concept and how important is it for an educator to decode and, uh, you know, uh, uh, let that unfold about how common misconceptions develop. Clearly a case in point. Um, uh, Amit, you have also, uh, uh, you know, when you were at IP, you worked extensively in the field of assessment. Uh, would you like to weigh in? Sorry, just a correction. I, I do work in assessments now, not with IP. <laughs> and the Australian Council for Educational Research is well known for the work we do in assessment. I think I, I, I'm just going to go back to something that um, Lance said, which was looking at the curriculum as a sort of capability-based curriculum. And I, I actually had a question for him, which was, are you then thinking in terms of the in terms of a learning progression when we talk when we talk about the curriculum? Is that the kind of thing that we're talking about? Because that's a, that's an interesting concept that. Uh, seems to be gaining popularity these days where you look at learning as a continuum. And so when we at ACR, we talk about assessments, we actually talk about assessments that we, we start with the assumption that every student has an individual learning path. And an assessment should actually tell you where that student is on that path, uh, which tells you what they know and what they can do, and also shows for you what it is that they need to what they need to do to, to progress further. So the point to be remembered is that every single student is at different places on their individual learning path, which is where the, which is where we end up with a con in a conflict with the whole age versus grade kind of um, classification that we currently have. Um, so if you look at the curriculum as a, as a learning progression, then you're actually looking at a series of things that a student will go through. And that has linkages both vertically, meaning with grades above and below, and horizontally as with other subjects. And, and that makes it a more interesting way of looking at 
what the curriculum might actually be able to deliver and allows you to challenge students at the level where they are. And uh, Len, do you want to say something before we go to Jeremy? No, that sounded very sensible. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy, please go ahead. Um, just to uh, come back on, on some of those points, uh, uh, Len mentioned fractions. One of the issues with fractions is that many kids don't realize that fractions are numbers. Uh, they think that they're wholly different things. So they have to learn something, uh, something different. Whereas actually you can see from the example of the, the measurement there that the fractions fit on a number line. Um, and that, that when you use number lines, you can, you can start to teach kids that these, these fractions, these decimals are actually part of our number system. And we can look at the, the rules of number apply, up, up, applying, to, applying to fractions. Um, and you saw in that, in that video, kids talking through and using the number line to figure out what, 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 was, go what, was, what was going on with, with, with the measurement example. Just to come back on the, um, on, on the learning progressions and the individual learning paths. Yes, kids, I, and I think that continuum is, is really quite important to think of it as a continuum. The good news is that, that there's quite a lot of, 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 of stability around those learning paths. Kids do learn in different ways, but there are consistent patterns to, those, to, to the ways in which they learn. And we can kind of predict, we can kind of predict some, of those, some of those things. So we could all predict in mathematics education what has hap what happened with those kids and that number line and that measurement example. Because we've not just seen it in India, we see it in England. We'll see it in Singapore. We'll see it in China and we'll see it in America. We'll see those things and there are there are there are there are there are things in in um, in curriculum materials around the world that will help us will help us address some of those things. Yeah. And, and absolutely um, you know uh, I'm just going to read aloud a, a four-line excerpt from a grade three English textbook from India. It says, uh, the excerpt begins, does a balloon man visit your market? Let's see what this balloon man brings with him. He always comes on market days and holds balloons, a lovely bunch. And in the market square, he stays and never seems to think of lunch. This is from grade three. When we know more than three fourths of our students can't access this text. Why do we print it and give it to our students? Why is common sense not common? Lucy? Um, I think I think this the a, a good answer to this question would actually come from Lance, because I'm gonna use his his work to illustrate this. Um, and I, for, forgive me, Lance, I can't use your exact terminology, but I think for, for many systems that they are designed to look like education systems. And often that's the mistake people people make, I think, when learning from other education systems is, is copying the form of the system rather than actually thinking, right, what's going to work to bring out learning outcomes. And I think perhaps that, that's the why is because it looks it looks good internationally and and well, two reasons. Partly it looks good internationally to have a curriculum which is ambitious, is is how people would frame it. Although going back to Lance's point, I don't think it is ambitious if if it's you're not it's not harder it's just shallower um and i think partly perhaps it's because the people who design the curricula are designing with their own children in mind and often the people who are designing the curricula from very educated backgrounds their children have had very rich educational home environment and probably can access that um and so there's a disconnect between what most children are able to do um and what their own lived experience is perhaps but um I feel I feel slightly kind of embarrassed trying to paraphrase Lon's own work when he's actually sitting here. <laughs> and do you, do you want to go ahead? Why do we have such an inaccessible text when everyone knows our children can't access it? Land? Um, are you there? Yeah, I, I am. I, I I thought Lucy did a great job, though. <laughs> 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 I do think there is, a, I think, what I refer to as global isomorphism that 
you know, people adopt the forms that make it look like the system uh, is a high performing system and then are more, you know, concerned in some sense with uh, the, the form than the actual function and can easily, you know, these systems can lock into isomorphism. Um, and then second, I, I think there's just, it's just very difficult to come to grips with um, the variation in performance and how to address that. Uh, um, even in, you know, I, I have a sister-in-law who teaches mathematics in a US system in California. And she says, even, even in a US system, which is all the training is the opposite, um, often teachers will teach some concept and then if the student didn't understand, that was a reflection of the student. That, well, that student's not going to learn. Um, and, you know, and hence you can perpetuate having these really difficult textbooks that are far beyond the actual capability of the students. And then in some sense, redirect the blame onto the students that if they can't read it, rather than say, why have we not equipped students to reach this standard? Um, and I think it, it is a, 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 which, which, but, you know, and then at the same point, it really is an achievable standard. It really is the case that India could in fact have an education system in which every child could read that passage. It's not impossible to do. I, I, I worry, um, you know, Vietnam, I, I want to, I want to use Vietnam as an example because for two reasons. Um, one is, I know that some people think, well, you know, India is just a poor place. We have a, you know, low back, you know, low income, a lot of, you know, first generation learners, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But um, there has been a long-term longitudinal study that's actually tracked children called the Young Lives Study. And the Young Lives Study has been, you know, tracking children from the time they're two years old to almost 18 now, um, same children over time. And one of the really, I think, super important, and one of the sites of the Young Lives was Andhra Pradesh in India. Um, and I'm not 100% sure it's still in Andhra Pradesh, but it was in Andhra Pradesh. Um, and one of the sites was in Vietnam. And one of the really super important findings is that at age five, as best they could assess, Indian kids and Vietnam, Vietnamese kids looked enormously similar terms of nutritional status, in terms of the pre, you know, pre-literacy measures of cognitive status. It wasn't that on average Indian children were disadvantaged. And all of the gap between Indian children and Vietnamese children emerges between the ages of five and 12. You know, so, uh, so it, is, it is the school. It's not that Indian children are incapable of learning and Vietnamese children are capable of learning or that they have higher socioeconomic status or that they have better nutrition or et cetera, et cetera. These kids looked identical at five and looked wildly different at 12. And the reason is, I mean, in some sense, the reason has, to, and you know, every way they can slice it, the reason is what happened in school. So what you have to ask yourself is what happened in Indian schools that kids didn't get to being able to read that grade three passage and does happen in Vietnam. And then the second point I wanna make is, um, and this is embarrassing in many ways, but I'll say it anyway. Um, it's embarrassing because I'm the research director of a large multi-country research study that's supposed to you know, answer the questions about high performing systems. And one of our country studies is a the country of Vietnam, and uh, we have a large long-term research study. And when I press the researchers to answer the question, why is it that Vietnam has such performance? Uh, the answer is because they wanted to. Huh. It isn't any identifiable feature. It isn't expenditures. It isn't, you know, oh, they have teacher training. It's it really is more, much more fundamentally that they believed they could, they believed every child could, and they believed getting every child to a universal high level, you know, or universal early level of mastery was in fact the goal. <laughs> and, you know, it's a little embarrassing for researchers when the answer really is kind of that simple, but, you know, 
I think the answer kind of is that simple. Vietnam achieves high levels of performance and achieves with roughly the same material conditions of India, incredibly high levels of performance, particularly in terms of performance with equity, as Luke, as he says, because they wanted to. And so I think one of the starting points for India is really, did you really want every child to be able to read that passage? And if you did, why aren't you doing it? And if you didn't, and I think fundamentally, originally, the, the education system wasn't designed in a way that they truly believed and wanted every child to be able to read that passage. If they didn't, what has to change so that you really, inside the system from top to bottom, are all in for all for learning that we really believe India can be a place in which every child can do it and really wants to. Yeah, now I'm just re reflecting on two points. Do we really want to? Uh, particularly, you know, how Pradav started uh, by saying how much uh, value we attach to the education reflected by the amount of spending, private spending uh, that Indians make. Uh, so just sticking with that question. The second reflection that stayed with me from what you said, Lant, was while it's a school, the blame is redirected to the child. And I'm, I'm thinking uh, the psyche of a child who has to grow up consistently being told that you're not enough, that you're inadequate, that you're a fool and that you're behind. Uh, I, I will return to these questions and, and, and similar themes, uh, particularly on a couple of questions closer to home of what we try to do in, in Delhi government. But before that, let's take two audience questions. Uh, one is from uh, Harpreet Kaur. Harpreet, uh, are you there? Yes, Anurang, I'm Can here. Can you please switch on your audio and video and ask your question? Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Am I audible? Yes, yes, you're audible. Please go ahead. Uh, warm greetings to this esteemed panel, and it has been a very, very learned uh, this discussion that's going on. Well, first of all, I'll take the opportunity to assure you, Professor Nat Pritchett, that we definitely want to do it. We, the Indian educators, the Delhi educators, we have that will amongst us. And the kind of progression that we are seeing today during this discussion, well, we are talking about the learning progression of the continuum of learning paths. And Professor Banher, he has been telling us that we need to employ different pedagogy. And Lucy, like you just said right now, that we have this we need to have teacher guides that we have in Singapore. So here I need to know from you, all of you in fact, that uh, like what happens now? We are upskilling ourselves, right? So we are upskilling ourselves and the Delhi government, the, we have the bill of the government also with us. Harpreet, uh, might I request you to, uh, you know, uh, point to the question that you have. Yeah, I'm coming What's to the, the question. question? So what I'm trying to understand from all you esteemed educationists is that how I can take my students further. I teach the higher grades. So how do I teach my students toward, towards the high order thinking? Like how further should I equip myself so that I'm able to lead them? Here we are focusing on the students. So from sure. the educator point of view, how do I lead them? There? I think, uh, uh, Jeremy, you. since... Uh, would you like to take that question about how do we better equip our teachers to handle the kind of challenges and the handle the kind of transition that we're talking about in both our curriculum design, assessment design, and the pedagogical practices? Um, well, we've covered some of these points earlier. I, I think um, in, in, in terms of higher order thinking, ask higher order questions. Ask, 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 ask why questions and ask explanatory questions as to how as 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 to how how you how you how you got the how you solved how you solved the problem one thing that um uh, that uh, teachers the, t the teachers can use is a kind of think aloud protocol so th a think aloud protocol is is a way of explaining how a teacher thinks about a problem in order that they make explicit the things that they're thinking about as they're approaching a problem. So you take, you, you, you take a problem, you've got some prompts for the teacher. So they, they explicitly say how they're, how they're approaching the problem so that the kids can, um, 
um, uh, can 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 hear can hear some of that. But you 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 have to ask kids to to say more than one word answers. Kids have to uh, kids, kids, kids have, have to have some opportunity to talk through uh, what 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 they're thinking, and finally have more unpredictable questions. So that, uh, so that so that so that so that kids and uh, kids have to have to have, have, have to think. It 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 it's a uh, it's somewhat counterintuitive. If we're not making mistakes, we're probably not learning. So kids have to make some mistakes. That's different from failing, but kids have to get some things wrong in order to get some things right. Because it's only by getting things wrong that you realize what you what you what what what, what you've actually what you what you've actually learned. So there has to be some room for for mistakes. Lucy talked about about challenge, and 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 getting that 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 challenge right, the sweet spot between between challenge and and something that's too high is of course is of course not 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 straightforward, but but it it is important. Yeah, absolutely. We the children need to be getting something wrong to get something right. Banha, what is your experience on it? I'll just add to what Jeremy said. So uh, answering the question, I'm an educator. If you want all your students, even the struggling ones to engage with higher order thinking, what Jeremy talked about, the thinking aloud, uh, that will be teacher modeling. Another pedagogical tool teachers can use is teacher scaffolding, asking questions. And thirdly is letting go, giving them a chance to think. And that brings me to the next point, which is the classroom routines teacher use. Do the teacher go in and teach from the start till the end? They should not, obviously, if you want a thinking culture. Do teachers provide at least five or six learning experiences? Give them a problem, give them a task, let them explore. Exploration. And then afterwards, conduct a structured discussion to get to the learning goal for the day. Discussing. So exploration, Structured discussion. Do they get a chance to summarize in their notebook, in their journal? We call that journals in Singapore. Do they get to do journaling, writing in their notes? Do they get to reflect? Do they get to practice? So those are five learning experiences that all students should get. So uh, answers to educators, uh, the pedagogical tools we use, modeling, scaffolding, letting go and the classroom routines we have in place, exploration, structured discussion, reflection, journal writing, and practicing for consolidation. So I would, I would say that's the answer for educators. And my final point is that whether it is government or educators ourselves, these are the three methods we learn to become better teacher. So for teacher, educators, or governments, that's what you do for teachers. And if the government or the system doesn't provide for it, this is what we do for ourselves. We learn through three approaches. As educators, we learn by experiencing the learning for ourselves. If we want to teach in a certain way, we ourselves must have experienced that learning to want it so much for our students. Secondly, observe learning. Thirdly, Reflecting. So experiencing, so teachers learn by experiencing it from the learner's perspective. Sec secondly, observing learning in action. Example, like lesson study that Lucy mentioned on the first day. And thirdly, being a reflective practitioner. So uh, that's my response. Uh, a friend of mine once very nicely put it, uh, that people don't, don't learn from their experiences. They learn uh, by reflecting on their experiences. That's a quote from Dewey, John Dewey. Wonderful. So my friend clearly took credit for it and misled me. Well done. <laughs> uh, Pranav, you wanted to say something. Yeah, I think, you know, first of all, uh, kudos to the Delhi government and all the Delhi teachers for implementing many of these reforms. But, uh, you know, think about that teachers are, should not be alone. Right? There can be a lot of support. I think what 
major opportunity that has emerged from COVID is the use of technology, right? And I don't think the Delhi government has uh, sufficiently sort of embraced technology in a way that is helping teachers achieve their intention, not replacing them. And again, you know, Jaypal and, and, and Rise have done numerous studies which probably show that just simply giving away technology will have zero impact on learning outcomes. So if they were to just give away tablets or laptops, that would not make a difference. But there are also studies that have shown that, you know, when technology is adaptive and Land had this slide where it showed sort of in a grade eight classroom, you have learning levels that are spanning from grade one to grade eight. Anecdotally, we know it, but through data, it's now sort of uh, makes it more concrete. So learning levels are lower than where they should be. They are heterogeneous, even when it's homogeneous socioeconomic and they're growing over time. So if the technology is adaptive to each child, uh, if the technology is based on pedagogy research, it's not just a digitization of a textbook or a video. If the technology, if the learning software is actually contextualized to a child's uh, language, uh, provides the mother tongue support, provides uh, objects that they see in their everyday lives. If the learning software is data driven, where it's generating lots of data that's being analyzed and improved. And finally, if the software is also subject to third party independent trials. Um, so, you know, if, if, if the intersection of all of these, um, there are solutions that can double or triple the learning compared to a control group. And all of this can be done for less than $10 per child per year or 600 rupees, 700 rupees per child per year, which by the way is less than 3% of the current Delhi government spend uh, on you know, per child per year in terms of funding, right? So whether you count as a 3% inflation or a replacement of the bottom 3% of the budgets, it is possible to provide a high quality learning software, which will then sort of support the teachers whose main issues are you know, very different learning levels. Like if you look at the q and it's all about like, how do I cater to such a diverse cohort of students? And so teachers need to believe that they don't need to solve this problem alone and that they can rely on technology as their assistants, as their aides, as their friends, uh, so that the children's learning outcomes, you know, dramatically goes up. Absolutely, teachers are not alone and that's a key theme. You know, there is a, uh, on our YouTube channel, uh, there's a question from Tyler Petty. She wants to ask, how do other education systems tackle the issue of children's motivation? Lucy, what's your understanding from the countries you have studied? The question of children's motivation. Sure, so, so just obviously absolutely enormous question, but I'm just gonna give two, two brief examples. Um, so, so one, I suppose, um, I think we'll probably come to this in the panel tomorrow as well, but it's the idea that you have these big ideas, as everyone's been discussing today in the curriculum, but those, the, the national or the state level curriculum needn't have the context, as needn't give teachers the exactly how they should be teaching it. That has to come from, from the teachers or at least the cluster level, so that teachers can take those big ideas and, and think about how can I make this relevant to the child's life? And partly I think the motivation comes through that, through them seeing the relevance of, of the work that they, that they are doing. Um, but I think the second part of it actually is what's very motivating is success. Um, and, and crucially, not just success, not I've done something easy and I succeeded, but something was difficult for me, but I persisted and I had support from my teacher and then I succeeded. And actually, if, if we meet the children where they are and we give them the support that they need, that motivation comes about by itself because it's an inherently enjoyable to, to um, work at something and then finally succeed at it. So I think some of the things we've been talking about today the byproduct will be um, increased student motivation because there's nothing more demotivating than sitting at the back of a classroom where you haven't got a clue what the teacher's saying. And I think that explains a lot of the, the dropout rate that there currently is in India. Uh, uh, you know, interestingly, similar was the experience uh, uh, in our classroom. In 2016, uh, the Delhi government did a learning assessment of all the students and 74% of class six students were found to be not able to read their Hindi textbook, which is the mother tongue. Or uh, I would say the Hindi textbook for classic students was way ahead of where the students were. Uh, you know, I, I would go back to uh, each one of you, but Lucy, if I might continue with you for, for a minute. Uh, when you mentioned how tracking or, or you know, sorting or grouping of students in early years is adversarial or it has an adverse impact, but having come to that situation, uh, what interventions, in your view, um, have worked? 
you mean you mean later on after early years in the later years okay um well i, I think it it seems from the 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 bcd report that the the delhi reforms the the um Chinati program has been very successful which involve grouping within classes so i you know acknowledging that some students are not able to reach where they are putting them in groups and teaching them if if what they need to be taught is reading teaching them reading you know just admit that they can't and and, and start there but with the aim of as soon as they've got it moving up a group and then moving up a group again as opposed to those things being fixed um and i think elsewhere i mean it, it is resource intensive but um including top performing systems, when there are gaps, they are using um, qualified teachers to work with small groups of students um, in lessons when the other children are doing another activity, between lessons and break times, before school, after school. And of course, that really relies on um, Indian teachers not having a huge additional burden of administrative workload. They need to have use the time in school when they can to support students who need extra attention rather than having to do paperwork. Um, and then thirdly, um, using peers I think there's a real kind of hidden capacity almost within the Indian system already because you do have those students who you know maybe it's only 25 percent but 25 percent are reading they are at grade level they are um, able to to get to grips with those concepts and what many top performance systems do is make the most of using their students to work in groups with students who don't yet understand and to help explain it to them um, either within a class or in some in some countries they actually get older students to support younger students um, and and both parties tend to enjoy it uh, you know the time is up it was a lovely discussion but before we wrap up uh, there's a curriculum committee in the Delhi government which is going to recommend, um, you know, a revamped curriculum uh, very soon. And since most of them are listening to you anyway, uh, what is one piece of advice would you like to, to give to that curriculum committee, which is revamping the entire curriculum for Delhi government? Let's begin with you, Amit. Um, a few things I'd say. One, as you revamp the curriculum, focus on core skills and how those might be uh, incorporated. Focus also on how those skills can be used. So application of those skills would, would be equally important. Uh, ensure at the same time that there is um, an effective system of, of assessing progress, making sure that you assess each child individually rather than cohorts as groups. Uh, two other points, one, remove the pressure from teachers of having to complete the curriculum. So look at your curriculum in a way that, that actually is focusing on delivering core skills for, for children so that they can master those and start to apply them rather than this is the document, let's get through it by the end of the year. Uh, and finally, I would say involve more teachers, experienced teachers and experienced head teachers in policy making, in these kinds of committees that are that are looking at curriculum and so on, because I think one of the things we suffer from is that all our policies are driven essentially by civil servants. Uh, we don't involve enough academicians or enough teachers, enough lead uh, leaders in in developing that policy. So I would say make sure that you involve all of them. That's my two bit. Absolutely fair. Jeremy? Uh, well, the, the less is more uh, that we've been talking about all the way through here is, is very important here. Uh, the one thing I would say is you need to see the curriculum as a way of communicating with teachers, not just about, about what the aims of the curriculum, but, but how, it, how, how, how it's being achieved. So the curriculum needs to be in some way educative for the teachers. Um, so you're communicating to them. Banha? Uh, I, I would say one thing, which is in the design of the document, make sure the four variables are taken care of. Uh, first one is direction, a clear direction to anyone who reads it. Second one is the push variable. There must be something in the system to make the teacher want to do it. In Singapore, our national examinations that in, include challenging problems or unusual tasks um, make the teacher want to teach skills for students to be successful at those. 
there must be a support variable because doing all these things are quite difficult. Teaching students to do novel tasks is not the easiest thing. Make sure they have the support, whether it's from teacher training or the everyday materials they use, like the problem I used at the start came from the textbook. And finally, the, the leadership variable. Make sure your principals, your head teachers attend the same training uh, as the teachers so they know exactly what their teachers are supposed to do. Make sure the, the leadership variable is taken care of. So direction, push, support, and leadership variables uh, should be considered. Uh, that's my little two cents. Lan and Pranav? What would you advise the curriculum committee? I would advise the curriculum committee to stretch but not break. Uh, a friend reminded me at one time that I told them that no one's ever accused me of being humble, but if I had to accomplish the national curriculum framework in an Indian school, I would fail completely. It's, it's just too much. So I think I would advise them put yourself in the classroom, could you do this? And if you can't accomplish the curriculum framework you're writing in an Indian classroom, it's wrong. Uh, it, it has to be clarified, uh, you know, more fundamental. And secondly, you know, like I say, my only real teaching experience is at Harvard. Even at Harvard, even with graduate students, we had to acknowledge there was a trade-off between breadth and depth. And we chose to go deeper to get conceptual mastery in the ability to apply over, because the pressure for breadth is just enormous. Every, oh, the two student needs to be exposed to this and needs to know that, needs to know that, and needs to know the other. And you end up, you know, paper thin across a huge topic, which doesn't fundamentally convey, convey capabilities. Whereas if you convey in-depth capabilities, which is what I think all of the panelists have been saying roughly the same thing, uh, it, it's going to be much better to have true mastery and depth of fun, more fundamental and foundational and core skills than the paper thin, oh, the, you know, they've been exposed to polygons of the following type. It's do they really understand area and how to compute area is much more fundamental than do they have been exposed. So anyway, but the main thing is put themselves in the shoes of the person they're expecting to do this. Uh, and if they can't do it, then then it's wrong. And I could, I, the national curriculum framework that I read some years ago, it was just, I, I would, you know, I actually said I'd shoot myself if I actually had to get this done. I, I, I would fail. And Pranam, Lucy, very, very briefly, what would your advice be? Yeah, I think the curriculum is a necessary but not a sufficient condition to improve learning outcomes. Right? I think there's a risk that the committee feels that just because they've made a good curriculum or a good framework that the problem is solved. And I think that would be as far from the truth as possible. So my recommendation is to go beyond, you know, build your curriculum based on all this expert advice you've gotten there. But for that curriculum, then for each great subject combination, what are the top five misconceptions? What is the current student data? How can teachers remediate that in a form that teachers can access on WhatsApp in real time? integrated use of technology. That is ultimately our goal is to improve learning outcomes and curriculums and frameworks are only an intermediate step to that. Lucy, final word. And, and that's what, what Pranav said is what I was gonna say. So thank you very much for saying it for me, fantastic. Um, and yes, just basically make sure that the supportive materials for the curriculum support teachers to support students who are struggling. Um, and also to stretch those who've already got it, you know, make it easier for teachers to teach a diverse group of students through the materials that you, you provide them with and involve teachers in the creation of those materials crucially as well. Absolutely. Wonderful principles. And I think uh, a wonderful, wonderful discussions. And I can't thank you enough uh, for taking out the time and speaking to, to us. Uh, thank you very much. It was absolutely wonderful discussion. Um, thank you very much. Uh, tomorrow, uh, at the Delhi Education Conference, we shall delve deeper into what informs curriculum decisions, design and delivery. So do join 5 p.m. at our YouTube channel. Thank you very much. Have a, have a good night, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you.